the word about life from First Peter is uh, this is a this is a passage that I I learned when I was very young and it has stuck with me always. Um, especially the verse that says, "Always be ready to make your defense." to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. I am grateful to Peg and Sue and Alicia as they speak of bones in the desert and they speak of hope. I hear the argument that people crossed a border and broke a law. I want to remind us that the law is arbitrary. For years it was a misdemeanor. But then as our society, we got all scared and anxious and we bumped the same human activity to a felony. What never changed is the human drive of hope. But what did change is our felt need to criminalize it. For this third Sunday of Advent, or what we have cleverly themed Adventure Time, we lift the theme of hope. And during our time of stewardship, we explored the idea of giving in order to take care of our home. For the weeks leading up to Christmas, we use our imaginations to join the Holy Family in a pilgrimage away from home to a spiritual and holy event. Again, look at the map on the front of your bulletin and you can see that we have traveled from conflict to peace, from sorrow to joy with the help of the choir. And today we travel from despair to hope. Again, there are two things I want to convey this morning, an invitation and a promise. The invitation is to use your imagination for the Advent season. This is a time of year when we can do this and be most able to use our imaginations and be forgiven for doing so. And these weeks will be full as Christmas stockings with songs and stories of flying reindeer, overworked elves, and talking snowmen. Wink at each other and for moments participate in the magic. Open your hearts and minds and take your imaginations up a level. Imagine that the next few weeks you are on a pilgrimage from brokenness to wholeness. Specifically for today, it's a pilgrimage from despair to hope. The second thing I want to convey this morning is a promise. The promise is that we can move from despair to hope. When you look up the definition of despair, it is difficult to define it without the word hope. In fact, the definition of despair is the absence of hope. It is the feeling that everything is wrong and that there is no way that anything can ever be right again. Despair is often the first emotional shock wave of sorrow and loss. This past July, when Peg and I were out of town, Amelia called Peg with great fear and panic and dread. Amelia found our grandson Fletcher in their swimming pool unconscious. Amelia jumped in, pulled him out, resuscitated him, and called 911. Amelia is our shero. (laughs) And many things were set in motion, and Fletcher is fine with no lingering effects. While Peg and I were 1,700 miles away, which added to our helplessness, Jean and Cindy McWhorter were there for us at the hospital, and we're grateful to them. When Peg got the call, 
and Amelia could hardly talk. The message was that Fletcher had drowned. Peg's immediate reaction was physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Her legs could not hold her up. She fell to her knees, she cried out, and she dropped the phone as despair overwhelmed her. In that moment, everything, everything in the world is wrong. And there is no way that anything would ever be right again. Despair is one of the most profound human experiences. Not a United States citizen experience, not a Mexican citizen experience, not a, not a Rwandan experience, a profound human experience. And it can manifest itself in suicide, for suicide is called a disease of hopelessness. According to Law Enforcement Today magazine, the Rudderman Foundation reports that suicide is 20% higher among first responders than it is in the civilian population. As first responders see the best and the worst of humanity, they need help in processing the emotional toll that their jobs take on them so that they do not get lost in despair. According to Military Times magazine, quote, in the last four years, the official government estimate on the number of veterans who die by suicide has gone from 22 a day to 17 a day in the latest Veterans Affair report. But the rate of suicide among veterans didn't decrease over that span. Instead, it was the way that the government figures out and sorted and presents the facts. That's what changed. In contrast to this, our church Yesterday, we hosted a group of veterans whose mission is to find other veterans and to enter into a conversation about what kind of political leadership do they want representing their views, representing their experiences, representing their values. See, they're not getting lost in despair. They are working their hope. And they find a home here at Shadow Rock. One summer when Peg and I had a group, we led a group to the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota, we arrived at the news that 11, 11 Native American teenagers had committed suicide on that reservation within the last three months. You see, they arrived at a moment in themselves when Everything, everything, everything in the world is wrong and they have no way of seeing how it could possibly, anything could be made right again. That is despair. We see it. We feel it. And yet the word about life says to us, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you and to do so with gentleness and reverence. You see, to do this, It means that we must have hope in the first place because we cannot share what we do not have. I feel the struggle of hope for hope. All of us have these emotional, spiritual wells 
And all of us have these wells of hope. And sometimes the well runs close to being dry. But our hope might just barely be a trickle. And yet, when life brings me to a place of the push of despair meets the shove of hope, I feel hope winning. I do not hold a conviction about the goodness of life as some kind of rationalization, some kind of defense mechanism against despair. I'm not rationalizing and I'm not delusional. In fact, some of you even would say, Ken, why are you so depressing? What I share with you, not a conviction that I hold, but rather a trust a conviction that holds me. I begin with the acknowledgement that I don't know anything. Despite my ignorance, I believe that at the center of all of life there is a mystery that reaches out to me. And I experience the mysterious heart of reality, not as despair. Not as despair that destroys, but as love that creates. I witness this every day. And when my spirituality is at its healthiest, I can experience this truth in every moment. I see it in your smiles. I see it in your hope. I see it in your tears. I see it in the hope that you have for each other and for your family members and the hope that you have for this world. There is so much ugliness in the shallows of life but so much beauty in the depths of life. Mystery is such an important part of it. Proclaiming the mystery, reaching out to the mystery, being vulnerable enough to be touched by the mystery is the most important reason for us gathering here every week. It is not the warm fuzzies. And don't tell Heidi, but I'm going to say it. It's not even the offering. (laughs) And she would agree, really. It is the mystery. I love Flannery O'Connor. She wrote, quote, The task of the novelist is to deepen mystery. And then she pauses and she says, but mystery is a great embarrassment to the modern mind. It's so sad. We are in this great spiritual paradox We want to resolve all mystery. And yet we want spirituality. We want to experience mystery. But we struggle to be vulnerable with each other and vulnerable to the way life is. When we cut ourselves off from mystery, we cut ourselves off from hope. Our time together is for letting the mystery be. 
rejoicing in it, celebrating it, affirming it, letting it fill our dry wells of hope. And even now, even now as I speak to you about it, I do it a great injustice, and I'm sorry. I speak of it as if it's a thing, a thing that's a part of our lives, a thing that we look for and seek out. And the truth is, Mystery is life itself. We breathe it the way a fish breathes in water. And so the word about life, always, always be ready to give an account for the hope that is in you. And yet do it with gentleness and reverence. I hope you hear the subtext in this word about life. I pray you have hope for yourself. And so then you have something to share with others. People are desperately looking for hope. And when they see it, when they see it in you, they're going to ask you about it unless they have become so cynical as to dismiss the hope that you have. That is tragic. But that's also on them. When you are asked for an accounting of the hope that is in you, be ready. Also do it with gentleness and with reverence for them and the mystery, the mystery that is beyond us. And most importantly, the gift of mystery that is in us. Amen.